Happy New Year to all of you. I'm glad to see you. I'm glad to see all of you guys that are online with us today. Thank you for, um, for no matter how late the night was last night, you got up and, and came to the house of God today. You're joining with us, and we appreciate it. Pastor Jay is with his family today, and we're glad he's able to be able to have his entire family with him t- together and them being gone together. So I appreciate you letting me come and share with you today. This is a good day. Now, we're beginning, of course, in January, we're going to be focusing on prayer. We have starting a week from tomorrow, that's on the 9th of January, the 21 days of prayer that we do on an annual basis. We're going to focus during that 21 days of prayer on some specific things in the church. But uh, I do want you to know that there's a guide, a devotional guide, that will be ready for you to get in the foyer as you go out. Uh, and, and it'll sort of guide you as to what all is available, uh, other resources for some of you want to go deeper, you want to begin the process of learning how to fast and adding fasting to your prayers. So uh, just want you to know that's what's going on. Now we're, we're calling the series, as well as the devotional, blessed, blessed. Now think about this. When you go somewhere and you say, how are you doing? And they go, blessed. It's awesome. It's Somebody say, I'm tired of people saying blessed. I'm not. I mean, what would you rather hear? I'm tired. I'm, 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 I'm mad. I'm sick. I, I look, I like it. Somebody says they're blessed. Because the Word of God tells us we're blessed. Uh, what we're going to be doing, we're going to be focusing in this series in January about a, a prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 1. It's a prayer that he prayed for us. And one of the things he mentions is about how blessed we are. And so that's what we're going to be talking about, and that's why this series is called Blessed. Now let me just give you a little background about about what we're doing today and what we're studying out of the Scripture. This is from the book of Ephesians. Now Ephesians, written to the church at Ephesus, Ephesus was a large, sprawling city in the Roman Empire. It was at a crossroads. It was a Greek-speaking city with a Roman government. It was a a big deal, a large city. It had all kind of cultures there, multicultured. It had lots of different belief systems, lots of religions. It had a lot of paganism. It had had strange religions, even a lot of the occult religions. There was a lot of the Jewish people there as well. It was just a multicultural, sort of a world kind of city, a wealthy city, very wealthy. It was a challenging place to plant a church. But that's why God told the Apostle Paul to plant a church there was because it was a crossroads. People could come there, hear the gospel, and take it to all parts of the Roman Empire. And that was God's purpose. So the challenge of it being in a crazy place like Ephesus was not so big for the gospel because it was God's chosen place. Now, there was a church there. Paul had established it. It was a small church, but it was growing. It was growing as churches are supposed to do. So Paul, in prison, writes a letter to them, and he tells them the things that are the most important things they need to know. Now, the key verse that that we're going to focus on, the key verse is chapter 1, verse 3, and this is the verse. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, here it is, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So the Apostle Paul said he was blessed. And he said, we are blessed. Now notice the phrase that ended that, in Christ. Did you notice that, in Christ? It is really strange. In this book, Ephesians, 35 times Paul says, in Christ. That was a thing. It was being in Christ. It was not, it was not just uh, something he threw out because he couldn't think of anything else. It really meant something. What Paul was doing is he was pleading in prayer. He was saying, Father, I pray those believers at Ephesus will know what kind of blessings they have because they are in Christ. They, are, they, they, didn't, they didn't join the church there just because they agreed with a bunch of doctrines. No, they joined Christ. 
They are now in him and he is in them. It is a spiritual union in Christ. It's a big deal. It was a big deal to them. It's an amazing reality in Christ. There's also a phrase that we had in there, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. Heavenly realms? There is an earthly realm, and that's the one we're living on right now. That's this world, an earthly realm. It's where we live and love and learn. And then there is a heavenly realm. That's the place where everything is already perfect and incredible and God is complete ruler of all things. Now, Jesus left the heavenly realm, came to be born in the earthly realm, and then he accomplished the work of God on the cross and the resurrection on the earth, in the earthly realm, and then he was taken back to the heavenly realm. And he said, if you're in Christ, now you get the benefit of the heavenly realm while living on the earthly realm. Amen. Now that's why you're blessed. That's pretty good, isn't it? It's that connection we have. It's, it's, it gives us the ability to hear the Holy Spirit, to walk the way God says, to accomplish the will of God, to be purposeful and powerful, and to, have, to, have, to be prosperous in the way that we minister the gospel. Because we are in Christ. In a dark world, yes, but we're in Christ. And we are given all the blessings of the heavenly realm for us to enjoy and to use in this realm. Now, it's the same for Christians today. It's the same thing for us at Kingwood. God has given Kingwood Church and every church that knows Jesus and every individual believer, he has given you the ability to be in Christ and to enjoy that relationship that's supernatural. It is in Christ. Incredible. It's incredible. When we realize who we are in Christ and any church that finds out who they are in Christ will change the world. It'll change the church and it'll change the world. Folks, that's what we're going to be praying about this month. That's what we want for Kingwood Church. We want to know who we are in Christ so that we can be everything we need to be for this world, for Shelby County and beyond. There was this guy uh, that he, he, he didn't like to wear seatbelts, okay? He hated wearing a seatbelt. He was very proud of the fact that he didn't wear a seatbelt, told everybody he didn't wear a seatbelt. And uh, he had a friend, a co-worker that scolded him often about that. You know, man, you need to wear your seatbelt. It's just a smart thing to do to wear your seatbelt. And he was not going to wear his seatbelt. Well, one day, this co-worker uh, had, had uh, flown at the airport and needed someone to pick him up. So he called the stubborn guy that wouldn't wear the seatbelt. And he said, hey, man, would you come to the airport and pick me up? Sure, I'll be glad to. So sure enough, he came and he picked him up. And he, he jumped in the car and he looked over there. And his stubborn friend was all buckled up. And he went, whoa, man, something changed. Hey, you're wearing a seatbelt. What happened? What changed you? He said, man, over the holidays, I, I went to the hospital to visit a family member who was in a bad accident and went through a windshield. And I, and I walked in the room and I saw hundreds of stitches in his face and on his head. And I said, hey, I think I'm going to start wearing my seatbelt. So his co-worker said, man, I've been telling you that for a long time. Were you, surely you understood before you went to the hospital that if you went through the windshield, that's what could happen to you. He said, yeah, it's not new information, but when I went up to the hospital, that information became real to me, and it changed the way I live. Folks, that's what Paul is saying. Paul says, when you know who you are in Christ... No, no, not when you believe you're something different in Christ, but when you know who you are in Christ, it'll change the way you live. It'll change the way we do church. It'll change everything. And that's what he's trying to say. So what are the blessings that we already have in Christ because we are in him? What are those blessings that Paul is so thankful for? What are they? Well, that's what, that's what we're going to talk about. And today I want to introduce what the first one he thought of, this really big deal 
on the new year, I want to tell you his first thought when he said, this is the blessing I, that I know that I have because I'm in Christ. You ready? It's this one. It comes from Ephesians 1.15. Here we go. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Paul was overwhelmed that in Christ he was part of an incredible spiritual family. He was overwhelmed. He said, I can't stop thanking God. He was thinking about the church at Ephesus, thinking about the new members there. And he was thinking, wow, these guys have, in a rough city, they boldly declared their faith and they put their faith in Jesus and they're hanging in there and working together. And I am so thankful to be kin to those people spiritually. I am so thankful for my brothers and sisters in the Lord. He was overwhelmed with it. He said it, I I give thanks, I can't quit being so thankful. Notice, he wasn't focused on the problems in the church, and they had them. He wasn't uh, all torn up about all the sins that some of the members in the church were committing. That wasn't the first thing that came to his mind. He said, I am so glad that I'm a member of a family of God, and you at Ephesus are part of my family. Man, that is, that is an amazing thing. Here's the big thing to remember today. You ready? Here it is. In Christ, we are blessed with a spiritual family. Can you say amen to that? Amen. amen. Now, we know how important our own families are here on earth and how we love to hang, hang with our families, even though we don't always get along with everybody in the family all the time. But we like to hang with our family. Over the holidays, Peggy and I, went to an, another city, and we spent some time with, with some family members, aunt, you know, aunts, uncles, cousins, stuff like that. And we sat and laughed and had the most fun. We, we relived old times. We, reli- we talked about family members. We laughed. We honored all their achievements. We, just had, we had an incredible time just celebrating with blood. You know, they, they weren't perfect. They're still not perfect. But they're blood. They're my family. They're my family. I love my family. They're, they're my DNA relatives. Now, nowadays, it's a big deal to trace your ancestry. Anybody tried that? Oh, yeah. You, you, I don't know how smart this is, but you send your DNA somewhere. That's brilliant. And they, <laughs> then you, they send you back and tell you all the people in the world you're kin to. Now, when we all know that we come from Adam and Eve via Noah... We got an idea we're all kin somehow. But you find out all those relatives. I, I, love, I love delving into it. I've, I've gotten emails from people in different parts of the world that I never knew I might be kin to and the cousins, 14 cousins removed and all that kind of stuff. And it, it's sort of neat, it's sort of neat to find those things out. You find out stuff that sometimes you find out stuff you didn't want to know, but sometimes you find out stuff you, you're glad to know. Like, like man, I... I don't know if anybody knows this, but I've got some royal blood. I'm kin to the royal house of so-and-so and and the duchy of so-and-so and and the kingdom of so-and-so back in the 1850s. Or or I just found out that my great-great-great-uncle was the guy that stole a boat from this farmer and took it to George Washington's army so the the army could go across the Delaware in 1777 and they could paint that thing of Washington across the Delaware in his boat. Man, doesn't that make me feel good? We get all puffed out like we had something to do with all that because we're kin to them. Hey, listen, let me just tell you, I got something in my pocket I want to show you. I got fish it out of my pocket here. Oh, yeah. This is, this is a cowbell. All right, it's a cowbell. I, I taped the ringer so I wouldn't sound like a cow coming across here. <laughs> this is a cowbell. I want to tell you something about this cowbell. When I was about 12 years old, my job at the Ashland Pharmacy, where my dad was a pharmacist, a legit one, not a drug dealer, a pharmacist, <laughs> I got to deliver the items to the shut-ins and people in town on my bicycle. And I would go around and deliver it. So there was this lady, and I would deliver her medicine about every two weeks. 
and uh, she would let me see all the stuff in her house, and I noticed there were three cowbells that she had up there, and one day I asked about the cowbells, and she said, you know what, let me tell you a story about those cowbells. They were passed down to me from my great-great-grandfather. They were passed down. They were actually made on Mount Vernon, George Washington's farm. They were crafted at Mount Vernon. And I went, <gasps> and she said, you know what? I don't have any children. I'm going to leave those to you and your brother and sister. Folks, it was the greatest thing in the world. I have cowbells from George Washington's cows. It just made me feel so big and important. Now, I know, I know that I don't have any proof of that. She might have made that up. But I believe it. Of course I believe it. I have to believe it. They're my cowbells. Well, I take my grandchildren up to my study, and they see the cowbells. And I go, hey, these came from George Washington's farm, passed down in the family. And, of course, to my grandchildren, it's Pop, George Washington gave Pop a cowbell. <laughs> That's okay with me. <laughs> it's cool with me. It's, that's all right. I have white hair just like George Washington, absolutely. You know what? When, when, we, when we talk about family and things, we're blood. We're blood. And you, and you honor your family. Even sometimes when they're not that great, you honor them. Hey, listen, should it not be the same way in the body of Christ? Should it not be the same way with all of us sharing with one another and even in other places and the, the whole huge body of Christ? We are DNA relatives spiritually in the body of Christ. It's true. Let me tell you a story. This is, this is not a great story about myself, but I want to tell it to you. And um, when I first came to be a pastor here, a youth pastor, uh, I would go with Pastor Ron, who's sitting right over there. I would go with him on hospital visits all the time because he needed someone to help him drive. He drove, but I told him there's a red light up here. You, know, you need to slow down, stuff like that. But anyway, uh, it's so true. Anyway, I love you. One time we went to Shelby Hospital, and uh, it was my first trip to Shelby Hospital, and we were going to go to see someone that uh, was in the hospital that was suffering from cancer. And uh, we got in the elevator, and we were going up. You know, there was only two floors back then. We were going up one floor. And uh, another fellow pastor got in the elevator with us. I didn't know him, but Pastor Ron knew him. And, and uh, he, he, he called Pastor Ron. He just called him Cox. Hey, Cox. He said, hey. He said, I didn't know your people ever got sick. I thought they didn't get sick. And I thought, good grief. And Pastor Ron said, oh, yeah. He said, we, we're like everybody else. We, uh, we, we fight the same battles everybody fights. And uh, so it just incensed me that he had said that. So we get back in his Volkswagen to, to find our way home. And we were going somewhere. He always has a side trip to take. So we were, we were going on a side trip. And I said, I could not believe what he said today. I can't imagine a pastor saying anything. And I just, and he said nothing, and that's a miracle. He said nothing. <laughs> Pastor Ron said nothing, not one word. And, and I thought, he's not, he's not listening to me. And then I said, what do you think about that? And he said, well, Mark, to be honest with you, I pray for him every morning, and I just don't feel like I need to say anything against him right now. And I went, oh. <laughs> I thought. I don't need to be a pastor anymore. I, this is a bad thing. You know what I just done? I just defamed a member of the body of Christ, a fellow man. He wasn't perfect, but I just done what I just accused him of doing. Folks, I want to tell you this. this the body of Christ is important. It grieves the Holy Spirit when we get on social media and say things like, I hate it when Christians who say they love you wound you at church. I love Jesus, but my church has wounded me. Let me tell you something. You've just grieved the Holy Spirit when that happens. It may be a true statement, 
But you work that out in the body of Christ. You don't work that out on social media. That doesn't, that doesn't work. That's not, how, that's not how we are in Christ. In Christ, we don't hang the dirty laundry out. We work that out among ourselves because we're a body of forgiving people who know how to change. We don't work those things out there. That's not how we do it. That's not how we do it. Hey, look, if, if, um, if you love Jesus, you love your brothers and sisters in the Lord. I just felt like I needed to share that because that's what Paul was basically saying. Ephesian church, with all your problems, I love you so much. I am so glad to be related to you in the gospel. And that's the truth about the church. It's true. It's true. God sees us in the heavenly realm. Remember, that's how we're looking now, from the heavenly realm. He doesn't see us with our differences and divisions. He doesn't look down and see us as Democrats and Republicans and conservatives and liberals and different races and, and rich and poor and, and strong Christians and weak Christians and mixed up Christians. And he doesn't see those labels on us. How does he see you in Christ? He sees you the way he sees his son who died on a cross as pure and free. That's how God, and that's what God says. I want to let you look at your own brothers and sisters the way God sees you instead of the way the world sees us. God sees us not how we were, but how what we are becoming. No, we're not there yet, but we're becoming that, and God sees us where we're going and what we're becoming, not what we have been. Shouldn't we do the same to one another? Divisions and prejudices prejudices should never arise among us at all. Let me tell you something about your spiritual family. Your spiritual family that you're part of, I'm talking about worldwide. This one and worldwide, but the worldwide one has been around for over 20 centuries. It has survived for over 20 centuries. It is made up over the years of billions of members. It is proven strong in the face of persecution. It is proven courageous in the face of trouble. It has, it has remedied evils in this world. It sometimes is red hot in revival. It has stood against evil. It has brought hope and healing and life and love and kindness to this broken world for, for 20 centuries, that's what it has done. And I guarantee you, if there's anything good that's happened in this world, the body of Christ had something to do with it. It's the truth. The world, the world may never know the heroes of faith because they don't sometimes show up. But in heaven, they will be crowned as heroes of faith. And we know that. And we're part of those, those heroes Forget George Washington's cowbell. Man, I could ring some cowbells about the heroes of faith that I am so thankful to be connected to. Yes, Paul and Silas and Moses and all of those and all the people here that I'm connected to, you're heroes to me as well. And I'm thankful to be part of that family. So why is it so important to understand the blessing of being in a spiritual family? This, this is this is it. This is what I'm saying. Number one, God's presence on earth is best revealed through his family on earth, the church. Now, God has revealed himself to the world in many ways, through creation, you know, through, through uh, prophets that spoke. He's, he's revealed himself in many, many ways. But he has chosen to reveal himself to a lost world through the church. So don't honk about the church wounding you. Just get behind what the church is doing and let's go do the work of God in this world. That's with the truth. He has chosen to reveal his powerful presence on earth through the body of Christ. I want you to look at this scripture. For where two or three are gathered in the my name, there I am among them. Hey, how large, how large does a church need to be to be a church? Well, two or three. 
at least two or three. Jesus said that's all it takes. Just a tiny gathering of believers makes it available to all the blessings of heaven to operate through that church. It can be a house church or a mega church. God sees no difference in the two as long as they're flowing according to the Spirit of God. And that's the kind of family we belong to. Some families gather in big family gatherings, some in small family gatherings, but the same Spirit is flowing through all of those. God has made it that way. No one church more important than another. Hey, we belong to a certain group, a denomination of people, but there are a lot of God's believers that have differences in small areas, but they are my brothers, they are my sisters, and we're all in the work of God together. There are no lone rangers in the kingdom. Now listen, it's the truth. No lone rangers in the kingdom of God. No one person is the body of Christ except Jesus. No one person has it all. That's why you have to be connected to other believers. Maybe two or three, but you got to be connected. That's what God says in his word. Don't write off the church. It's here to stay. You know, in a, in, in, when there are two or three, two or three are gathered, the, you know you have right there the ability to fulfill what Jesus said were the greatest commandments. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. You can do that with three people. That's true. Now here's the second reason why it's important to be, to understand the blessing of a church family. Prayer is most powerful when God's family prays in agreement. Ooh, folks, this is so true. Um, that scripture I gave you from Matthew 18 a minute ago, I want to show you the one that precedes it. Verse 19 says, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. There's something very special about believers praying together in agreement. There's something powerful about it that, that the world can't understand. And it's not like, oh, we're going to get a lot of people to pray about the same thing and it's going to make God feel like we've given him a petition. We've all signed a petition and it forces his hand to work. That's not what it is. God just wants to see his people work in unity. And he speaks when his people work in unity. There becomes a, 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 a confidence we have to know what the will of God is when we pray and we understand what God's will is in unity. It's a big deal. Hey, it's a big deal here. I want to tell you something. Every Sunday morning, every Sunday morning, the, the pastor, whoever's going to be preaching, I, that was me this morning, gathers with a group of our prayer team members and have them pray over us. And I want you to know, every single week, Pastor Jay and I have talked about this, we talk about it every week. Every week we walk in there where the prayer team is and people begin to pray and they say, I feel like the Lord is saying this. Every time it confirms something that we had prepared or that assures us that we know we're on the right track, that we're doing what God said, we're able to preach with power because there's confirmation from other believers. That's how God works. That's how he, good, how he does. There's agreement. And when there's agreement, we all know we're together. It's not one person says, under God, I'm going to do it my way or, or nothing. No, I want to know what God is saying to others so that I'll know what God is saying to me. It's important. James 5, 16 says this. Uh, that it's a, the powerful, pow, excuse me. Powerful, fervent prayer of a righteous person is effective as one person. Imagine if you've got a lot of powerful, effective prayers all agreeing together in unity. Think how powerful that is. Hey, several years ago, in fact, I, I guess it was in the, the last year we were able to do the Scrooge play. Um, that, that year, and I think the year before that, those two years, we gathered together a list of, of people that didn't know Jesus, that we were praying for to come to the Lord among our life groups at Kingwood Church. You might remember that. We gathered a list, and every, every Sunday, we prayed over those names, and we had all of our prayer teams praying over the name, just first names of people who we wanted to see come to the Lord. You know, that very last uh, time, I guess it was, I guess that would have been 2019. I guess it was 2019. We, we had all those that we wanted to see, uh, names of people we wanted to see come to the Lord. And uh, 
that year we had a fire in the sanctuary. The, the, the Scrooge's bed was up there and it burned. <laughs> Sorry about that, but it, I wasn't smoking in my bed or anything. It just it was something else. But anyway, the bed burned. We had to, it, it was awful. We had to stay up all night. The place was wet. And we, somehow, in one day's time, we were able to get things done enough to continue the, the production. We did the production for three more nights. And folks, that year, over 500 people came to the Lord. Over 500. Now listen carefully to me. That was not because the play did it. Because we've been doing that play for 30 some years. It was the prayer behind the play that did it. So whatever we do in the name of Jesus, when there's prayer behind it, there are results. Does that make sense to everybody? It's, it's the, the uniting in prayer. And when you take life groups from this church and other churches gathering together, praying about what God wants to do in this world, it can happen. Because that's what God does. That's how he does it. It's true also in the home. When husbands and wives agree in prayer for the family, it makes a huge difference. Now you know why God doesn't like it when husbands and wives pray together. Satan doesn't like it. Did I say that wrong? Satan doesn't like that. God does like it. Satan doesn't. God likes it when husbands and wives pray together because it is doubly powerful. And that's the truth. Here's the third reason, the last reason why it's so important to understand the blessing that we have in the family of God. All the gifts of the Spirit are found only in the spiritual family of God, the church. There are people that want to exercise all God's spiritual gifts all in them. I'm going to walk around. I'm going to be Mr. Spiritual Gift. I'm going to be Mr. Church. I'm going to go around where I go. I'm just going to be the embodiment of it all. Not true. God says that does not happen. God says in his word that he has given the gifts to the church. They are gifts to the church so that the church can work together and we can work together and help one another and lift one another up and replenish one another's oil of anointing. That's what God says. We minister to one another. 1 Corinthians 12, 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, we need each other. The Spirit is given the gifts so that we can be built up and strengthened and healed and the words of God can flow and we can be encouraged and the oil of, can fill our lamps over and over and we can serve God and take it to a broken world. That's why we have to be a body of Christ and I am so grateful for the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 26 if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually you are members of it. I am so grateful that I'm a part of the body of Christ. And I'm just going to tell you, after being a pastor here 45 years, I want you to know I am so grateful that I have for 45 years this family of God that is as much my family as anybody in the world. This is, this is our family. This is, you have given your life to me and I've given my life to you and that's the way it ought to be. Let it be, let it be. We enter a new year today with the prayer of the Apostle Paul in our heart. And I think it's a great place to start. I want you to do me a favor. I just want you right now, just look around, just look around at you, just look around. That's your spiritual DNA you're looking at. That's your blood. The blood of Jesus has flowed, flowed through their life too. That's your blood. That's the people God has connected you with. Paul said it. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. In 1984, Peggy and I had gone to Missouri. I went to um, graduate school in Missouri and uh, came back here to the church. 
But while we were there, uh, we were away from this body that we had been so connected with. And uh, Lindsay, Lindsay was a little bitty, uh, like one-year-old, one-and-a-half-year-old or so. And uh, there were some physical uh, problems that she was having that frightened us greatly. And I weren't sure what it was and all this kind of stuff. And it was just so frightening. And there we were by ourselves. Although we had a, 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 a church there, it's just that the, our DNA was still with so many people here. You know what we did? We spent most of our time on the telephone calling. We called June Creel and we called Faye Porter and we called Eric Harden and we called all, we all, called all the, the people that we knew were prayer people. And I, we, we just, it felt so good to know that I had a family of God that I could take whatever it was that we needed and we could take it and they would pray. They would give it their best. They would pray and seek God for us. And they did. I never will forget the joy of knowing that's my family I can call on. I'll never forget it. These are your spiritual family members. You need their counsel. You need their prayers. You need their encouragement. You need their help. You need their words. And let me say it again. They need your help. They need your encouragement. They need your words. Look around. We need each other. We need each other. And more than anything, the power we have by praying together in Christ for his will to be accomplished will do things that this world cannot believe. This year, I really believe God spoke to me and said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And I want you to know, I feel like this year, during our January 21 days of prayer, I believe God is going to begin to mold us into people who take prayer seriously as a church, as a body, as a family. And we start seeing things that are beyond our imagination of what God can do. Our worship team is about to come in just a moment. And we're going to stand and sing a song. I, I want you just to have that in your heart when we do. It's a song called Promises. God has given us so many promises, and His promises are all true. But they're not just true for you. They're true for all of us in the room. I'm going to ask you, if you will, and would everyone go in and stand, if you will? I'm going to ask you. Today, when, when we're singing this song, if you would just let your spirit say, God, help me see what I am in Christ this month. Let me see the power of prayer and the power of encouragement and the the power that I have, Lord God, to be able to share my life with this family. I want you to pray God would weld us together, put us together, give us the same voice, the same desire that God's confirmation would be of what he's going to do in our midst and that we would work together as a team to see what God wants and let it be accomplished. Father, I pray right now for everyone under the sound of my voice. Lord, as we sing this song, begin the work of wielding us together, Jesus. Begin the work, we pray. And then, Lord, draw us to that altar where we can say, God, I'm ready to change. I'm ready to, to start clicking the seatbelt because I know you want me to sit in this place and get this accomplished. I'm not going to wander away now, and it'll change my life. Jesus, let's sing together.